So as I mentioned in my welcome, um, today is World Communion Sunday. If you've never observed World Communion Sunday, it's a day that we, we celebrate the fact that Holy Communion, sharing in the body and the blood of Christ, unites us, not just with Christ himself, and not just with the people in our own congregation, but with Christians from different practices, from different traditions, different denominations, all over the world and throughout time. It's, it's a way for us to recognize that our practice, this fundamental practice of coming to the table together, brings us into communion with each other. And as part of this observance of World Communion Sunday, we take a special offering every year. And there's going to be a short video at the end of the sermon um, telling you a little bit about that special offering. And it goes towards scholarships. It goes towards scholarships for um, racial and ethnic minority students to help them um, pursue higher education. And so at the end of the sermon, after you watch that video, I hope that you will go to the link, follow that, and, and give a special offering for World Communion Sunday in honor of the way that when we work together as Christians, we're able to accomplish so much. And that when we talk about World Communion Sunday, Sunday that is usually what we recognize. We recognize the way that our unity as the church across the world and across time allows us to do so much good. We all know that when we work together, we're able to accomplish more than just an individual does. When Paul talks about the church, he uses the metaphor of a body. Because one single organ can't live alone, we need each other. And we all have different gifts and different skills and different ways to serve. And when we bring those together, we're able to accomplish amazing things. And that's all true. And that's important for us to recognize on World Communion Sunday. But I want to talk about a different aspect of this togetherness that we experience through communion. And a way that I think this practice, this practice of communion, not just in our own local churches, but recognizing it as something bigger than just us, can shift our perspective in a really important way. So you heard read this morning a uh, part of Paul's letter to the Philippian church. Now, he's writing this letter to a church that is struggling that is being harassed, that is needing his guidance, and he's wanting to encourage these believers. And so in the passage that we read today, Paul is talking about his own conversion, but he's also talking about who he used to be. He's talking and, and giving his, his resume about all of, the, all of the things that he used to hold as so important all the good things that gave his life purpose and gave him, him, him meaning, and the way that all of those things, all of those formerly important things, those identifying parts of himself, the things he was proud of, all of that has been changed because now he knows Christ. And he says that he counts all of those things, not just as loss, not just as garbage, but as sewer trash the lowest and worst garbage of them all. And now that he's had this shift in perspective, he's striving after something different. He's encouraging the Philippians to do that too. He's striving to proclaim the gospel with his whole life. That his life is not about him and what he achieves and his good deeds and the pats on the back that he gets but it's about this good news, the good news of Jesus Christ that he preaches in everything that he does. And he talks about participating in the suffering with Christ, the way that we will go through trials, that we will experience loss, that we will have to give things up, the way that the road will not always be smooth and easy, but that it may indeed be a struggle, but that he, he says that that's a road he's willing to travel. That's a thing that he now desires. And in our, our Methodist understanding of theology, we maybe would say that Paul is talking about going on to perfection. 
He's talking about the idea that our faith is always something that we're moving forwards in. We're always becoming more Christ-like. We're becoming more in union with Christ through our faith and through our discipleship. And that the farther along that road that we walk, the more we want that. The more that we're willing to leave the former things behind. Because we know that the prize ahead of us is so much more. Now, Paul doesn't actually talk about communion at all in this passage. He talks a lot about communion in 1 Corinthians, but not so much here. But I think our practice, the way we do it today, our gathering around the table with our friends and family and our congregation, I think that that practice of Holy Communion can actually reground us, recommit us to exactly what Paul is talking about, what he's teaching the Philippians. I think that when we practice communion together, when we come to the table, we realize what we once had and we're encouraged and taught to leave it behind. Now, by that I mean that when we come to God's table, there are no more divisions around us because everyone's welcome there. We don't get to pick who the guests are. And so any of the the insider-outsider dynamics that we might have in our life, any of the people that we want to keep out or that we want to keep away at arm's distance, we can't do that around the table. We have to accept that everyone's welcome here. And any of of the, the walls that we have built up, that God wants them broken down. We can't control the meal either. No matter how educated we are, no matter how wealthy we are, no matter how much status we have, it's not our table. It's not our dinner party. It's not our meal. And so we have to give up the control that so many of us cling to in our lives. The ways that we think that if we can just just hang on, if we can make things the way that we think they need to be, everything's going to be okay. We have to let that go. And we have to trust that the banquet that God is laying before us is really the meal that we need. We also have to stop trying to feed ourselves. This is a meal where God takes care of us, where our needs are met, where we simply get to sit and be guests because the grace that is poured out is not of our doing. It's a gift from God. And so all of us who like to earn, who like to know that we're good enough because of how hard we work, because we provide for others even, we have to give that up and let ourselves be vulnerable in this way of being children. Sat down at the table and having dinner spread before us. When we practice communion, we also have to remember who it is that we follow, who we're really committed to. Now, there's a lot of denominations, and I know that um, some number of folks that are watching this come from a, a Baptist background. And especially in the Baptist church, you oftentimes really see the memorial meaning of Holy Communion held up as sort of the, the, the primary way that we relate to um, this practice. And by memorial meal, I mean the Last Supper. And the way that Christ says, this is, this is my body given for you, this is my blood poured out for you. And then less than 24 hours later goes to the cross in this act of complete faithfulness. And so while as United Methodists, that's not the only or the primary meaning of Holy Communion for us, it is one of the meanings of Holy Communion for us. And I think it matters that we remember that. It matters that we remember the sacrifice and the obedience and the faithfulness of Jesus to this message of love, to this new way of living, to this kingdom that has come to earth and the way that it was totally rejected, even to the point that he's executed. We have to remember that aspect of Christ because that's what we're being invited into. We're being invited into a way of loving that's going to put us at odds with the world, that's going to require sacrifice from us, that's going to seem impossible at times. 
And that's gonna ask us to be faithful to something even when we don't see anybody around us being faithful to that same kind of love. That love that's, that's poured out for every person, no matter how worthy they are in the world's eyes. That's what we're called to. And so we need communion to remind us that that's what we've signed up for. That's who we've thrown our lot in with, is a God that would come to earth and be that faithful to this totally new way of love. Communion also prepares us for what we are meant to be, what we're going to be. This new kingdom that that Jesus declares is here and now. That kingdom is a place of unity where we can sit at the table, even with people that are nothing like us, that we maybe on on the outside would think are our enemies or are at odds with us. It's a place of welcome where no matter where you've been, you can come and sit at this table. It is a table that is laid for you. It's a, a kingdom of peace with justice, not the peace of the world through violence and oppression, but peace that is achieved through the thriving of all of God's creation. And that kingdom, that new way, that new love, it's exemplified in the image of a table, a table where we're all welcome to sit down, where a feast is laid before us, where we share and are together with each other, and with our God. And we're moving towards this. It's a now and it's a not yet. We live there now, we practice it now, we do our best now, but we also are looking forward to it. We're moving there with hope, with faith, believing that it's possible. And when we gather together for Holy Communion, that hope and that faith is bolstered up It's like feeding a sourdough starter when it goes dormant. You've got to give it a little flour, maybe a little sugar, maybe a little water, and get it bubbling again and excited, get those yeast working. Communion can do that for us when we start to lose hope, when we start to lose faith that the kingdom that Jesus proclaims actually is possible. So with this understanding of why communion is important, why is the world part important in World Communion Sunday? Now, I don't know about you, but to me, it feels like the world is kind of falling apart right now. We are dealing with widespread illness. We're dealing with, in America, the worst parts of our politics leading up to an election. We are witnessing, those of us with privilege, maybe for the first time, the historic and continuing injustices that are built in to American society. We're seeing our friends and neighbors suffer in an economy that continues to leave more and more people behind while while others gather and, and hoard wealth beyond imagination and beyond use. But in the midst of that sense that the world is falling apart around us, it's important for us to remember and for me to remember who I've really committed myself to, and that's to Christ. And Christ is not American. (laughs) Christ is not of any nationality. He is global and universal and cosmic in ways that we can't understand. And that's what our allegiance is to, not to anything here and now, but something bigger than any of the the problems that we're dealing with. It's also important, I think, to remember that we have siblings in Christ who are also practicing Holy Communion, who are outside of our particular American context and its problems and its sense of everything falling apart. And they're praying for us because they're praying for the church. And they're doing gospel work that we don't even know about. And they're dealing with struggles, some worse, some easier than what we're dealing with. 
but they too are at this table with us. It's also important, I think, to remember how long and in how many different circumstances Christians have been gathering together for this holy meal. Christians who have been in actual hiding, facing actual persecution, and not the kind that we like to, not the kind of Christian persecution we like to invent, but real persecution. And yet they've still gathered to share this meal together. Christians have gathered for this meal in the midst of empires collapsing around them, when I'm sure that the, the, the fall of, of kings and, and rulers and political systems and economies, that still the practice of Holy Communion and the kingdom of God persisted and outlasted any of those earthly institutions. Christians have continued to gather for this meal in the midst of famines and plagues and natural disasters when the very earth they stood on seemed to be against them. They've continued to gather for this meal in the midst of wars and threats of wars and in all kinds of personal and communal loss and fear and uncertainty. And so when I stop and I think about that and I think about how much bigger being a Christian is than the context that I'm in right now, that Christians are still out in the world doing good, that our faith is not just about our local context, and that the kingdom of God will outlast any problem, any empire, any political situation that we experience now, it gives me a little bit of peace because it shifts my perspective back to realizing who it is that I'm committed to. And it's not to, to the politics of this time. It's not to the economy of this time. It's not to the stability that I think I can do for myself. It's to a crucified God who still sat down and shared a meal with his closest friends and invited all of us to it. And so today at 2 p.m., we're getting together for the first time since March to share this particular meal, to be fed a little bit, to have a little more hope, a little more grace, to go back out into the world and to build that kingdom. So again, the event today is at 2 p.m., um, you're going to pull in in the parking lot um, behind the 717 building, the little white house, and pull into the first driveway in the new parking lot, circle around, you'll receive the elements, and once you pull out, you're, you'll circle back around the small parking lot next to 717 and then pull out back onto the street. And there will be plenty of volunteers directing you where to go. Once you receive the elements in your car with your family, I wanna encourage you to pause somewhere, whether it's in that small parking lot or right in front of the church, take a minute and actually share communion with your family. You'll break the bread, you'll share it with one another. You get one piece of bread and one can of juice per car. Um, and so that's for you to share this meal together. Not to everyone be served by, by me or by Allison but for you to, to break and share Christ's body and share Christ's blood together as a family. And again, Christ invites anyone, all of us, who love and who seek an encounter with his grace to this meal and to sit at this table. You don't need to be a member of Oconee Street to come to this event and to share in communion. You don't need to be a United Methodist. This table is open to all, and I hope that you will come.